Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Good afternoon, and welcome to another episode of Likeable Science here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm your host, Ethan Allen, and Likeable Science is all about how science is a vital and interesting part of everyone's life, your life, my life, everyone's. We're all connected to science. Science impacts our lives every day. And today, here in the Think Tech studios, I have Jack Burrill. Welcome, Jack. Thank you. Jack's an associate professor in the Department of Psychology at UH in the College of Social Sciences and studies the social determinants of health, sort of you call it, the, the bigger picture, the bigger context about what helps keep people healthy, happy, prosperous, growing, uh, all these things that we don't tend to think about, they go, that are a little bit outside of sort of medicine per se, mm -hmm. in general. Uh, a huge slew of factors, only really recently being recognized now, right? Oh yeah, yeah, I would definitely say in the last uh, 25 years, we've seen like a steady increase and more of a focus or understanding of kind of social environments and built environments and um, how culture intersect and really uh, make a difference in who succeeds, who fails, who lives healthy and who doesn't. Yeah, it, it's a classic example of systems thinking, right, where we aren't just individuals living our own lives, you know, where a doctor can just look at you and say, you know, da-da-da, do this, do that. It's, he, has to, he or she has to take into account the locale, your zip code, your friends, your occupation, you know, all these different kinds of things, your activity levels, uh, your diet, all these mm -hmm. things will greatly impact how healthy you are or are not, right? Yeah, it's, 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 uh, uh, so how, how did you get sort of started in this business, in this, this, in this, in this kind of studying? It's, it's sort of an odd field in a way. Yeah, yeah, it's funny. I, I really have kind of grown with the field in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, in undergrad, I was a health science major. And at the time, actually, I was thinking, oh, maybe I could go to the med school or, mm -hmm. you know, do a, the classic uh, health. And um, I graduated, and, and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. Um, so I took a job, actually, at a psychiatric hospital. Mm -hmm. And that was, um, I worked there for a few years. It was really interesting. Um, opening. I mean, it is. It's right. eye-opening. I almost would say everyone, I recommend everyone do it. Um, because uh, working there, what I found was those, you know, people came in and, and the people I worked with largely had pretty profound psychopathology, um, really active psychosis and things yeah, like they that. They weren't just in there sort of to get rest and relaxation. They were people who had been pushed oh, yeah. in there. Oh. Yeah, so the people there, it's a locked unit, so they did not want to be there. Uh -huh. um, so generally they're brought in by the, the cops, police uh -huh. usually, and um, sometimes they're kind of, kind of, almost always get a little bit out, out, out of their mind, but um, you know, sometimes they're, they're very peaceful and, and police tr were very nice and, and treated them well. Other times it was a little more rambunctious. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was kind of shocking because, you know, there is the seclusion rooms and, and literally like the leather straps and all the kind of classic nightmares that you hear of. Um, but I was always surprised at how well people would do once they got in there. So within a couple weeks, you know, you really see these transformations with people. Um, and I was like, wow, okay, this medicine stuff works. I was like, mm -hmm. this is amazing. Right. And then I realized after about a couple more weeks, sometimes a month would go by, they come right back. Well, I was gonna say, they disappear, but, but you see them again. <laughs> and I'd see them again, they look just like they did before. And I'm like, I thought we fixed it, you know? And then, like, it cycles like that constantly at, mm -hmm. at, at, in the hospital. So, um, I was like, there's gotta be more to this. There must be more out there. So I took a job as a case manager, uh, working on the streets with people with serious mental illness uh, that were experiencing homelessness. And I'll say, I, I quickly realized, I was like, oh, I figured it out. <laughs> there is a lot going on mm -hmm. out there. There's a lot of reasons why people struggle. Um, what I quickly realized is at the hospital, we were kind of packaging them up, like propping them up, mm -hmm. and kind of moving them on their way without any sort of supports available to them at all. It was just putting them right back in the same environment that brought them there. Exactly. Um, so, you know, it was, it was you know, shocking to see the kind of conditions and the daily lives that people live on the streets and kind of the, the backgrounds and the histories. It's just really something that's like touches your soul in a lot of ways. Yeah, and that, that's interesting. I, I mean, I like your idea that everyone should probably do this. It'd be a great form of sort of community service to have, mm -hmm. have everyone do it. And it would tend to 
one would hope sort of uh, engender empathy, right? We'd, we'd yeah. much more understand like, hey, they're, you know, but for the luck of the draw, go I, right? Yeah. Because a lot of these people, it's just random things happen to them, right? It's not a character flaw. It's not a defect in their personality necessarily at all, right? No, no. I mean, I guess, you know, I grew up in a kind of middle class mm -hmm. family in kind of suburbs of Washington, D.C. And I really, I mean, I didn't really have the same exposure to some of the events that people had. But when I got in the hospital, I'd read through people's charts and read their backgrounds, and I, it was jaw-dropping. Jaw and then I, when I was living on the streets, I really got to well, the know the kind of really incredible traumatic experiences people had in their lives, ongoing trauma, um, just really difficulties on just daily day activities that everyone else takes for granted. Right, right. We often don't realize how sort of smoothly our lives are progressing and how so many things aren't automatic and we don't worry about them. You know, most of us don't worry about where we're going that night to sleep, right? We're just, we know, we've got a place, you know. It may mm -hmm. be good, may not be so good, but it's a place and we can go there and, yeah. Uh, but you, you see there are communities where that's not at all true. Uh, and there are kids who don't know where they're going to be after school. They don't know where they're going to sit and do their homework, if they're going to be able to find a place, right? Mm -hmm. to, to sort of sit quietly and, and read or study or write whatever they have to do, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you can only imagine, like, if you're in those circumstances that you have this level of stress that's just ongoing, you know, it's kind of like, I'll actually, I teach health science or, or health psychology, and I tell people, you know, that if you have this chronic stressor, so there's almost no chronic stressor worse than living on the street, mm -hmm. that it's almost like you're trying to run from a tiger all the time, but if it never goes away, right. you it really does a number on your body physically, but of course also mentally, so a lot of the kind of... Uh, mental health problems that people experience are really largely contributed to the overwhelming stress that they're experiencing uh, yeah. in these circumstances. Little, little episodes of stress are fine and probably actually healthy, yeah. but, yes. but, but chronic stress like that, particularly for young people, really cha literally changes their brains mm -hmm. and makes them less able to cope with stress uh, as an adult, right? I mean, they, they literally react quite differently than an otherwise normal adult would. They'll, yes, they, absolutely. They, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, you, you literally even metabolize your food differently. Right. I mean, like, yeah. your, your body is reacting in a, right. just a way that's not adapted for what, what you're coping with. Yeah, so that's, uh, so, okay, so you've got then, well, this is a big problem, right? Yeah. <laughs> we understand, we see that every day on the streets and here around Honolulu, right? Uh, we see a lot of people. So, I mean, what kinds of programs are you working with that are trying to help these people out? And, yeah, so I work on a kind of, I'll say, a large portfolio of uh, interventions and programs that are designed to, to address needs of what I consider generally marginalized communities. Mm -hmm. So um, I work with IHS here with Housing First, um, and we're now in our fourth year, finishing up our, I guess, in a couple months, we'll be the fourth year, and then hopefully uh, we'll be starting up our fifth year. Um, and Housing First is a program, if, if you're not familiar with it, is one where we're, the, the idea is that you move people that have been with a long history of living on the streets, oftentimes with profound mental health and substance abuse issues, into a home um, without kind of having to go through any middle ground. So they don't have to go through substance abuse treatment, they don't have to go through mental health treatment to get into a place. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a problem here uh, because there's not enough places <laughs> to put people. Um, but uh, if that if that system works well, um, it it's that once you get into shelter now, all of a sudden you get uh, a number of these stressors reduced. You see that a lot of people with kind of issues around substance abuse and mental health issues that kind of start to dissipate. Um, and if you can put in wraparound services and case management around that, um, you see that people can really improve pretty quickly. Yeah, I'm sure it's not that's not a silver bullet exactly giving them a home, a place to that they can call their own, a place they know they go to each night. But it's a huge first step, right? If, if they have that, suddenly, as you say, it's it's you know sort of one one big tiger is now not chasing you, sort of. Right. You know, there may yeah. still be others, but yeah, there know. is, there but, is. But yeah, so it, it's funny because uh, yeah, so that's just a kind of what people would consider a basic need that you get met but there is a whole other i mean it's not like you can remove the 20 years that people lived on the streets or 20 years of trauma right. so there's still not a, a lot of assistance that's necessary but um, it does get you through that door yeah and, and then you can you can begin to to look at, at the uh some of the other issues so um you, you talk a little bit of, of, about the sort of the individual factors versus societal factors, and somehow sometimes that we sort of confuse these two, right? 
Oh yes, yeah, absolutely. Maybe you can say a little more about about sort of because I don't I don't know that our audience necessarily will understand that that distinction here about some definitions here. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I mean, my area uh, is in in marginalized communities. So usually, though, that I, I focus on health and quality of life that that people uh, experience. So. I usually use the example of, of homelessness as, as that, that when people think of homelessness, they usually think of individual factors, individual causes, you know, oh, someone has a substance abuse issue, someone has a mental health issue, um, oh, they lost their job. And these are concerns, I mean, don't, don't get me wrong, they, they are factors, mm -hmm. but they are not the determinants of who experiences homelessness, right? Mm -hmm. So these are things that uh, can, can hurt somebody, but what really causes somebody to not have a home is just not enough homes to go to, right? Mm -hmm. So if you look at places that have, you know, that are um, affordable, where there's plenty of homes, it doesn't matter what the individual factors are of the people that live there, everyone ends up still in a home. Mm -hmm. So would, would some place like Detroit right now actually have a relatively low rate of homelessness because it's Detroit, yeah. you know, it was a much, much bigger city with lots and lots of homes built and now it's got a much smaller population. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so I usually say the cities like, no offense, Cleveland, and stuff like that that are not like booming economies, right. they actually do pretty well on metrics of homelessness. Huh, interesting. Right? interesting. They don't do well on other economic right. metrics, and they don't necessarily do well on health metrics. But when it comes to homelessness, it's a clear, if there's not enough places for people to go, then someone's not done it. Right. I, I think you, you sent a graphic here. I think the first graphic actually talks a little bit about this, right? So this, yes. this shows essentially sort of the, the cost of living, if I understand it, uh, basically along the, horizontal, along the horizontal axis with higher ones being up there where San Francisco and Honolulu are shown, mm -hmm. and lower cost of living at the other end, and basically the homelessness rates, right? Yeah, so this is just one snapshot of yeah. one year. Yeah. Um, actually, so some people in my lab have been working putting this together. Um, so we have actually a series of these that we've looked at. Yeah. Um, and it clearly just depicts this linear trend of as rental rates increase, mm -hmm. the rates of homelessness increase. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at uh, areas like San Francisco is is really economically booming. There's a lot, you know, a lot right. of Tech and there. brains, a lot of wealth, <laughs> but there's also a lot of costs, right? So we think our rental rates are high. They're much higher in the Bay Area. Um, so you see that where places that have high rent end up having much higher homelessness rates. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, I actually think like if you can kind of fall in the bottom half of the graph, you're kind of doing better than you you should predictably. <laughs> where a city like where I'm from, Washington D.C., generally does a little bit worse than would be predictably. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also, because the, there's a lot of other factors that go into uh, DC's uh, circumstances. Yeah, so that, that's intriguing, all, all these, these uh, different factors and all, uh, what, what really spurs it. But then uh, your point sort of, a, of the individual versus social, societal factors, right? Where all those individual factors are indeed important and, and can be causative, if you will, for people becoming homeless. Homelessness itself ends up sort of triggering or causing almost more of those same things, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So when people are kind of marginalized, uh, whether that is because, um, well, you can kind of walk it back in the idea of if you live in a place that have enough affordable homes, that's kind of the baseline, mm -hmm. and you are marginalized by society for some reason. So you don't have a lot of strong support networks to mm -hmm. other people. Um, when one thing goes wrong in your life, you have no outlet, right? So if you lose your job and you have no one you can call, um, you have no one that can support you, you'll clearly fall to the bottom and, and you'll experience homelessness. And But then once you do that, then all of the other stressors that we were just talking about come, come in, come right? crashing down. Like and that. as when that happens, then people start to be much more likely to develop substance abuse issues, mental health issues, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and it goes both ways, but um, it, it's certainly then once you're though you're marginalized there, then of course people marginalize for your for experiencing homelessness. Right. And then once you do that, you you develop a substance abuse issue, and then people look and you go, no wonder you're 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 living on the street. You're abused the right. drugs, and then bingo, so bingo, you right. can never get back. So so we're going to follow this vicious circle okay. <laughs> more deeply here. But right now we're going to take a one minute break here. Uh, I'll be back here and with Jack Burrell uh, to talk more about homelessness, marginalized populations, and what we can do about them right after this short break. And aloha. My name is Calvin Griffin, the host of Hawaii in Uniform. 
And every Friday at 11 o'clock here on Think Tech Hawaii, we bring you the latest in what's happening within the military community. And we also invite all your response to things that's happening here. For those of you who haven't seen the program before, again, we invite your participation. We're here to give information, not disinformation. And we always enjoy response from the public. But join us here, Hawaii in uniform, Fridays, 11 a.m., here on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of New Japanese Language Show on Think Tech Hawaii, called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. And you're back here on Likeable Science with me, Ethan Allen, your host here on Think Tech Hawaii, and Jack Burrell. Uh, welcome again, Jack. Uh, Jack's a, a professor in the psychology department at, at UH, and we've been talking about marginalized populations, homelessness, and some of the issues that, that have caused this. And right before the, the break, we were talking about sort of this, almost this feedback loop where there are factors like loss of a job, no money, poverty, uh, substance abuse, mental illness that can trigger homelessness, but that equally, and probably as often, if not more often, homelessness itself, a condition of being homeless, tr sort of triggers one or more of those same conditions, right? Mm -hmm. So when one gets into rather a vicious circle, right? Mm -hmm. Because Absolutely. it's one thing if you've lost your job and you're, you've still got your clothes and your car and things, and, and you can sort of make do for a little bit, but if, as it goes downhill, you lose your car, you don't have clean clothes anymore, you, you can't get a job, you can't keep a job, you know, your kids aren't in school, nobody likes you, people avoid you on the street, yeah, and you start drinking more heavily, and yes, absolutely. <laughs> it goes down rapidly, I'm sure. Yeah, and I'm sure absolutely. you've seen this. Yeah, yeah, so if you have conditions of where you're living in a place that does not have enough affordable housing, I usually say, like, really affordable, like, Low income affordable rentals, right. not even just like, you know, things you can purchase. There's a lot right. of issues around that. Um, if those conditions are in place, then someone's not going to get in a home. And that usually happens for a couple of reasons. It's, it's either people that have no support system, or sometimes you do have people that have, uh, and sometimes they have no support system because maybe they have developed a, a mental health issue. Right. Um, there is kind of genetic links to that, and some people are more uh, predisposed to that. Um, and um, so, you know, these kind of classic factors that people consider um, as uh, being related to homelessness do, to some extent, relate to who ends up uh, without a home. Right. So that's shown in, in the second graphic, I believe, that we, that we have here. Right. All, all these, yeah. yeah, these factors, that, these various things shown on left, employment type, substance abuse, physical and mental health issues, and, and Life, Life transition, which is one of my favorite categories <laughs> that I just made up. I didn't make it up. I actually published a paper that kind of considers that. Uh, so those things are, are actually, unfortunately, way too common. But there are things like um, being uh, released from jail, oh. um, it, divorced, some, divorced. Yeah, some other. Sometimes it can be related, like evictions and other, like forced move for some reason. Death of a spouse, death of a loved one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. all those things, and yeah. they're actually quite causes. So. But you know what? What those sort of situations usually lead to is what, um, and I didn't make this up, is the, the metaphor of um, musical chairs, where mm -hmm. you know you have ten chairs. If you have twelve people, right. two people aren't going to get a chair. Now, who's going to be the people that don't get the chair? Right. It's going to be the people with those, one or more of those problems. Yeah. Actually, right. Because people who don't have those problems are looking for the chairs. And, yeah. They're and they're ready to, yeah, to, to grab them. To, right. Right. So you know, anytime you marginalize certain people against who can get into a unit, who can get a rental, right. then all of a sudden they're the ones that get left. But then the third graphic shows sort of that, that flip side of that, right? That once you are mm -hmm. homeless, then you've got even more problems. It's harder to get a job and harder to stay employed because you can't get dressed up, you can't get cleaned up, you may not have transportation. You, you know, you're going to probably be around a lot more people doing a lot more uh, substance abuse and who have more substance abuse problems and some of it's, you're, you're in an environment of that, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and likewise, uh, you know, you're, you, again, you've got sleeping on the streets, you run into violence, you run into trouble and may have more physical mental health issues and... and yeah, and well, so the issue is that, you know, like, 
the issue of homelessness or houselessness mm -hmm. is a state, right? right? So unfortunately, the way a lot of people, uh, not think tech Hawaii, but right. some people describe homelessness as, as like a, even an identity or they are homeless people, you know, mm -hmm. where it's really just a state that people end up in right. and it can happen to anyone. But what the problem with it is that once people fall into that, that uh, Houseless situation. Now all of a sudden they're experiencing homelessness, and now all of a sudden they are to be much more likely to develop all these other issues right. and continue with that cycle. It's it's right. then becomes a bigger and bigger jump to get back into housing, right. and and it's it's pretty complicated, right? Because the the state of being homeless really encompasses a lot of people with a lot of different issues. There are people who actively choose to be homeless, right? They don't want that responsibility of having a place that ties them down. That they choose to be living fast and loose on the streets. You know, there are people who have just lost their job and, and you know, lost their housing because there aren't enough affordable homes. There are people whose mental issues have basically driven them from their families and their friends. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, so yeah, I mean, there, there, and those categories, uh, this one, it's not a one size fits all solution, right? I mean, you, your idea no, of- No, it's very, it's very complicated. Of making, truly affordable housing will help a whole bunch, will probably help all, almost all those people, maybe not the ones who wish to be homeless, but uh, anyone else, basically. Yeah, and, and generally I would say that people that you could say wish to be homeless, it's usually that they're hopeless, in the sense that they have lost their hope in getting into a home. There's not many people that just grow up and they go, you know what I'm thinking? This is, I really don't grow up and, and live without a home, right? So it usually ends up people that have been kicked around quite a bit for a long time, and maybe they don't trust people anymore, they've developed mental health issues, they've developed a lot of circumstances where they are no longer kind of invested in society, mm -hmm. um, and that's because people mistreat them. Um, and there's a lot of reasons why people end up like without hope or, or feel that they can't uh, come back from their situation. Yeah, and then, and then again, it gets to be a very self-reinforcing thing. So they've given up hope, and, and, and they sort of abrogate certain parts of the social contract about mm -hmm. their appearance and how they yes. treat other people, and it all reciprocally, reciprocally feeds back onto them, too, and yeah. So, okay, so this is a huge problem. So other than going out and like, you know, building a gazillion new homes, what do we do about it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's a good start. Um, <laughs> You know, so I, I think just the way we n navigate housing in general is kind of a very important first step. Mm -hmm. So uh, building places where we um, don't have people that are marginalized within a, a building, I'd say a community, well, I'll say sometimes building a community and not buildings, right? So you have people that have social networks and have people to reach out to in times of, of, of trouble, and those sort of Situations also help support and uh, uh, bubble, create a bubble around people so that they don't fall all the way to the bottom. Um, I think part of the problem is we get there's a vicious cycle of criminalization that leads to people who are picked up, and there's a lot of reasons why pe people get picked up mm -hmm. for a, a lot of things. But what happens is if you fill the jails with kind of really low-level crimes, things that are um, just Crimes of poverty, right. um, whatever that is. Sometimes that's even just stealing something from a store because right. you're hungry. Right. Um, but when you they're in jail because of that, it backs up that jail. Right. So now that's costing a lot of money. Right. Now people have a they it, they can't make bail. They get charged. They get you know fines and things right. like that. And they'll never get out of that cycle because then once they get it, there's no discharge planning from that. Right. They say you served your time. Go back out there. Right. Um, so, so there's this program. I think it's called Leap. Right? Lead. Lead, sorry, not lead, lead. Law, law enforcement assisted diversion, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and so this is how to sort of break that part of the cycle, right? To take these people and not treat this as a legal problem, but treat it as sort of a social support problem, right? Yeah, yeah so LEAD is a new, new uh, program. It's being piloted in Chinatown, though. They've kind of been working with the, the boundaries a little bit, and hopefully they, they grow it in some other areas of, uh, of the state. But Oh, what happens is if they there's somebody that is kind of where they're not supposed to be, which could be in a park after hours, or we're working with some of the low-level drug crimes mm -hmm. and other things that are not violent crimes, mm -hmm. um, even some felonies. Personally, I think should actually count for lead. But 
what happens if they get picked up by a police officer? Um, instead of actually arresting them, they go, you know what? I, I really think social services would be a better fit for you. Um, so an officer is empowered to say, let me call a social worker. Social worker will come out on the scene, talk to that person, and if they're willing to then meet up with that social worker within the next month, then they don't aren't, aren't charged with anything. Um, so it, it, it cuts away some of this backlog they see, uh -huh. particularly at OCCC, and um, gives people a chance to then get integrated back into the system right. um, and have s developed some of the supports to help that. Sure, it sort of stops that first step on that slide down, or maybe the second step in some cases. Yeah. Uh, where they, yeah, they, they do get, it actually is providing some support. They get put in touch with organizations and systems that can actually step in and raise them and either give them a place to stay for at least a while or help them find a job or get them some clean clothes and a place to shower or what, what they may need, perhaps get them on medications. Because again, there are a lot of people who have medication problems, right? And if you're homeless, it's very hard to get your prescriptions filled. It's, it's hard to keep track of your prescription needs sometimes. Uh, you're right on what yeah. I am, <laughs> the other projects I worked yeah. with. Yeah, so uh, when you live on the street, that's actually one of the biggest problems is uh, that um, you you can't keep up with your medications. You know, it mm -hmm. rains, they get wet, and then it's hard to even keep track with other things because you oftentimes lose your identification. Mm -hmm. People steal your identification. Right. Um, so um, actually, for that point, one of the, the groups actually I work with are some of the people at the, the medical school is doing uh, and and health and. Uh, H3RC, Hawaii Health and Harm Reduction Center, uh, they've also worked with this. So we try to get people that have been diagnosed with HIV. Uh, they're living with HIV. They're not taking their, their medications consistently, um, but they're not making the, taking their medications consistently because they're largely right. experiencing housing issues, right. substance abuse issues, all these things that are like life issues. And for them, Keeping up with their medication, getting their appointments is the last thing on their mind and the last thing they're really capable of doing. Yeah. Um, hey, Jack, this is wonderful. Uh, this is so rich. I feel like we could go on for hours here. Yeah. Uh, but unfortunately, I'm told that uh, we are now actually out of time. Ah. I want to thank you so much for coming in, Jack Brill from the psychology department at UH, College of Social Sciences, yay. And uh, hope maybe I'll get you back here some other time. We can talk, talk some more about this. I hope that you'll come back next week for another uh, episode of Likeable Science here on ThinkTech Hawaii.